Good afternoon. And welcome to the National Capital Planning Commission's November 3rd, 2011, uh, 2011 meeting. And if you would please, uh, please stand and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. We have a somewhat light agenda today. Um, for all in attendance, I would note that this meeting is being live streamed um, for the world to see. Um, and I do note the presence of a quorum, so without objection, we'll proceed with the agenda as has been publicly advertised. And agenda item number one is report of the chairman, and I would simply like to note that uh, we've received a um, communication from DC Council Chairman uh, Brown that Councilmember Tommy Wells will be his first alternate to the Commission and Megan Vahey will remain uh, his second alternate so Councilman Brown uh, I'm sorry Councilman uh, Wells likely would join us at the at the next meeting as a regularly sitting member um, agenda item number two is the report of the executive director Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll also be brief today. I only have uh, two items uh, to discuss uh, with the Commission. First, I'd like to let you know that uh, we have officially released our Federal Triangle Stormwater Drainage Study, along with a companion report to the technical study, which summarizes the uh, staff's review of the findings. Uh, for the public, this technical report uh, and uh, our companion report are available on our website. In addition, on uh, October 31st, uh, we held in partnership with FEMA and the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers a very successful uh, Federal Triangle flood proofing seminar for uh, federal agencies, and we'd like to thank all those uh, federal agencies who participated in that, as well as our partners for a uh, great meeting. Uh, second, I'd also like to remind the Commission at the last meeting, uh, we had uh, presented a new format for our staff reports uh, to the Commission, the EDR's delegated actions uh, and Commission actions. And the new format is also posted on the website. Uh, we are seeking feedback from the public. Uh, and that closes on November 7th. And also, if the commissioners have any comments or feedback, uh, we'd love to hear uh, from you. So if you do, uh, please let me know or Deborah Young know uh, if you have any comments. Also, if you need additional copies, uh, we certainly will I'll provide those by the end of today. Um, so that's my presentation. Thank you very much. Um, any questions to Marcel? Um, agenda item number three is legislative update. Ms. Schuyler. I actually have one item to report. Um, uh, HR 2844 was introduced um, in the House on September 7th of this year. It's an interesting bill in as much as it takes two separate bills, which I've previously reported to you, the National Women's History Museum, Bill 1, and the Federal Facilities Consolidation and Efficiency Act, Bill 2, into one bill. And what the, uh, the, the two bills remain substantially the same. The National Women's History Museum portion directs GSA to transfer to the Women's Museum the site known as the Cotton Annex for fair market value. Um, the Women's Museum, in turn, is to develop it and use it as a museum. The FTC, the Federal Facilities Consolidation and Efficiency Act component is the portion based on the bill uh, uh, that previously directed the FTC to vacate its space so that the um, the national Mu the uh, national museum could move in. Uh, the two the combined bill is essentially the same the individual components as those that are still moving their way through the house. The only difference is under the women's museum portion, any money derived from the sale will not go to GSA's account, but instead will go to the general fund, i.e., into the treasury. Um, the FTC Consolidation Act will take uh, it previously directed that the FTC be relocated to suitable loose loose leased space. Uh, the GSA headquarters or 
uh, or one other facility which is escaping my mind right now. But what it does now is directs that the um, FTC go to the Constitution Building, which is the building where the SEC had previously leased space. They decided not to move in and they were directed to work with GSA to fill that space. So as of this point in time, there's approximately 350,000 square feet in the Constitutional Building, Constitution Building, which will I guess be the space to which they're looking to put the FTC. I will continue to keep you apprised. Thank you, Ms. Scholar. Any questions? Agenda item number four is the consent calendar. We have three items. Item 4A is the traffic mitigation measures at the Naval Support Activity uh, in Bethesda. Item 4B is the West Campus Access Road at St. Elizabeth's West Campus. And item 4C is the United States Diplomacy Center at the Harry S. Truman Building at the Department of State. Um, is there a motion on the consent calendar of those three items? It's been moved and seconded. seconded. Uh, any further discussion? All in, favor of the, all in favor of the motion say aye. Opposed, no. Carries. Agenda item 5A is the Federal Capital Improvements Program for the National Capital Region for fiscal years 2012 to 2017. We have Mr. Wood. Welcome. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, members of the Commission. Today, uh, we request your adoption of the proposed Federal Capital Improvements Program for fiscal years 2012 through 2017. This document reflects comments received during the public comment period, which was authorized by the Commission at its July meeting. During the 45-day comment period, additional projects were received from the Excuse me, from the agencies performing budget adjustments and were evaluated by NCPC staff. Uh, three comment letters were received from local government agencies and those letters are included in your packet. The FY12 through 17 program contains a total of 142 projects. 113 of these projects were submitted by agencies and 29 were submitted by NCPC as projects recommended for future programming. The estimated total cost of the agency submitted projects is $5.3 billion, which is down 39% from last year's total of $8.6 billion. In a moment, I'll discuss some of the issues that created this uh, decline. Projects from 14 agencies are included in the FCIP, and the largest total request for capital funding in this year's program is from the Department of the Army with $1.6 billion in funding requests for 44 projects. This total is followed by the Department of Agriculture with 13 projects totaling $500 million in requests for funds. No projects were submitted by GSA to this year's program. OMB guidelines state that agencies should not release out-year budget data without prior OMB approval. This year has, uh, uh, this has never been an issue actually in the past years, but given current budget conditions, both OMB and GSA were extremely circumspect in anticipating future spending. Staff expects that it will uh, be able to resolve this issue, but not until the current cycle is complete. Uh, given that that, will take us into the next FCIP cycle uh, to complete. Staff has made the decision to proceed with the information currently available. NCPC develops recommendations for all FCIP projects. These recommendations are based on each agency's conformance with NCPC's policies and plans and with local and regional planning goals and objectives. Of the 113 projects that are submitted by agencies, nine are recommended and strongly endorsed, 55 are recommended, and 49 projects are projects requiring additional planning coordination. Of the 14 new projects that were submitted to this year's program, all are recommended projects. Of the NCPC submitted projects, 14 are recommended and strongly endorsed, and the remainder are recommended for future programming. Um, as I noted earlier, NCPC received comments from three local jurisdictions during the public comment period. The City of Bowie, Maryland remains opposed to the Commission submitted project Freight Railroad Realignment NEPA studies. Fairfax County, Virginia supports all NCPC submitted projects for transportation in the region 
and the Regional Park System Project. The county expressed continued concerns with the impacts of projects at Fort Belvoir and the need for adequate funding associated with transportation improvements and the completion of an updated environmental and master plan. The county requests that no additional projects for Fort Belvoir be included in the FCIP until a master plan and environmental work are completed. Um, and I want to take this point to iterate that all the projects that we have in the, the program for Fort Belvoir are categorized as projects requiring additional planning coordination because they do not uh, fit in with any of the currently approved master plans and they do have issues related to transportation that are still outstanding. Loudoun County, Virginia supports NCPC's efforts to develop the Dulles Corridor Rapid Transit Project. All of the comment letters that we do receive for the FCIP are, are where appropriate are called out in the comments section for each of the projects uh, referenced and the comments are also forwarded to the appropriate federal agency for review and their reply. And uh, with that, I conclude my presentation with the executive director's recommendation that the commission adopt the federal capital improvements program for the national capital region for the years 2012 to 2017 and direct staff to provide the adopted document to the Office of Management and Budget and to regional jurisdictions and any interested parties. And uh, that concludes my presentation today. Thank you, Mr. Wood. For these 142 projects totaling more than $5 billion, are there any questions that have... Um, <coughs> Mr. Provincial? Uh, consulted with the Executive Director prior to the meeting, uh, I think it's worth uh, discussing. What does it mean when we have an agency that does not provide information? Does that constitute, formally constitute some kind of a nonconformance with the National Capital Planning Act? Um, so the questions that we would have is, is what does that mean? What does that, you know, what is the impact? Does this, uh, has there been a precedent in the past? Has there been agencies that for whatever reason did not or were, or were not able to? What, what are the impacts? Is it, a, is it an acceptable solution to say you get a pass this year? We hope, hopefully you'll be back on board next year. Financially and as far as the numbers of projects, uh, it, here's, here's a good example. The 11 to 16 FCIP had 146 projects, uh, 8.6 billion, uh, of which uh, GSA had 41 projects, 3.24 billion. So it was a huge right. element that is clearly missing when, uh, when this year's scope of projects is significantly less and it's just over 3 billion. So. What, what does that mean? If you would, just, just help us put it in context. Yeah. Um, well, thank you for your comments, and, um, Commissioner Provencia. Um, you are correct. Uh, it is a big uh, gap in this uh, current FCIP. As uh, Mr. Woods noted, uh, there, there are extenuating circumstances this year with respect to the GSA budget and their portfolio, which had led OMB, which manages, which we are sending this to, uh, by the way, in terms of um, transmitting the document, which has led OMB to ask us to, or ask GSA not to submit for this year. Uh, we have um, had had previous discussions with OMB and, their ex and the GSA examiner um, to discuss uh, the these issues uh, they have uh, they we understand their issue and they also have committed to sit down with us and GSA uh, to determine what can be put into the FCAP for the next cycle uh, that could be publicly released so they do understand that this is a issue uh, but also the OMB releases a circular with the budget every year and it is also clear that uh, agencies cannot release information uh, without the consent um, of, 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 of OMB. So they had not consented GSA to release this information to us <coughs> for this year. So the conclusion that we could draw is that OMB did approve other agencies to Yeah, they submit. But in this particular case, they had raised specific issues. So we. we and those them. issues were, it helped me with the characterization, something about some uncertainty in the mm -hmm. environment? I didn't quite follow that. Um, last, in FY11, GSA's construction budget was um, reduced significantly mm -hmm. and the GSA examiner I mean the um, the GSA administer administrator announced on Monday that it was possible that they may have no new starts in the coming year uh. and so given the fact that their construction budget 
um, is so uncertain at this time. They were, um, the issue was that they didn't want to put something out there that said that they were planning mm -hmm. a lot of major new projects when in fact, and give people the idea that there were all these new projects in the pipeline when in fact these projects may be delayed for possibly years. Mm -hmm. So another alternative might have been to submit, but with this caveat, that's not a apparently acceptable option. That we discussed the possibility of that, and they um, they determined that at this time they weren't comfortable with it. One thing that is worth noting is that um, CEQ issued um, a directive recently that was negotiated with OMB. Um, that says that in future years when agencies <coughs> release their sustainability plans every year, their performance plans, that it includes information about projects that they have in the works or um, capital projects in the pipeline. And so what we are planning to do is to work with the agencies and with OMB to make sure that um, <coughs> That, that what they are asked, what OMB is asking for as part of the sustainability plans is consistent with what we are putting together and agencies aren't required to put together two separate separate mm -hmm. pieces of information. Can we assure, uh, uh, infer then, for example, if OMB approved multiple other agencies to submit their budget, there is some certainty in those budgets, it's just that GSA has the uncertainty. How about the larger issue of, uh, I've gotten some feedback from my department that, you know, well, from one aspect, that, this may, is may I follow up on that? That's the question I was gonna ask. If there's uncertainty in the GSA budget, so therefore they did not want to send the signal or the inclinate or, the, or imply that these projects are in there so they're going forward, by that logic, it would be to say that other agencies' projects that are listed are indeed going forward. And I don't think that's the case. I don't think that's necessarily the case. So that's inconsistent. No, I, I think that... Um, it appears to be on, on the surface, uh, yes. Well, I'm, I'm reluctant to say that it has some that it has something to do with the individuals involved, but in fact, that is the case. I think that certain um, certain people are more are being more reticent about the political message they may be sending than others. Not in not in Washington. <laughs> <laughs> what about the other issue of uh, I get feedback from my department, for example. This may constitute acquisition-sensitive information that we put out to the general public. Is that is that the that's, defense? Is that's, it, it, that, it is pushed that's out one to of the, the issues public. that we were going to discuss with OMB because that's also part of GSA's concern. Mm -hmm. So um, and OMB. So we we need to be and when we push this out publicly, I think that we do need to distinguish kind of what's important for public information versus what's uh, what should be held uh, within right. the because what, what we're telling the uh, the industry the market is what we're going to do when we're going to do it what our cost estimates are our current program there may amount, be some other, the scope yeah. and there so may forth. be some other ways to convey this information that puts us at a disadvantage you yeah. know there may be some other ways to convey this information to the public because I think from the public standpoint they should know kind of what's okay. being planned sure. the extent sure. of it mm -hmm. um, you know in terms of magnitude and you know overall cost estimates but I think in, in, the specifics I think are what's concerning uh, OMB, so we, um, that's part of our discussion that we'll have with them uh, next year. So, and just one more point, as an executive branch agency, we do have to comply with OMB requests. So and this was a specific request they had made to us uh, for this cycle. So um, I do feel obligated that we, um, we respect that. But the end result is we have a document that is missing a big piece, unlike years in the past. That's so correct. That should be fully known. Any other discussion? Jim, I don't know which age, which agency it might fall under, but is there any uh, pushback on money for uh, the Homeland Security facility uh, on the uh, West Campus in this? My understanding is that the U.S. Coast Guard headquarters project is fully funded, and um, and that project is proceeding as planned. But at this point, um, none of the funds for the um, additional work in restoring the historic campus has been budgeted at this point. So is, this a, is this a new position or is this just where we've been for a while? I would say it's where we've been for about a year. Mr. May? 
Um, I just had one small question. On page five of the report, you mentioned that Federal Highway Administration deleted a project um, <coughs> feasibility study for Baltimore Washington Parkway widening. Um, do you know why that was deleted? Lack of funding. Okay, because the study is actually going on now. According to the agency, there wasn't a sufficient funding right now to continue with that portion, so they were deleting mm -hmm. it at this time. Okay, thanks. Other questions or comments? Just one follow-on question, please, sir. There's a, in the uh, comment letters that were submitted from uh, City of Bowie and, and others, uh, Fairfax County, there's some pretty strongly worded uh, opposition. Our um, approval of the FC, SCI, FCIP, I would assume, then indicates respectful consideration but non-concurrence with those strong objections. Is that a fair way to I, I, um I believe that the projects that Fairfax County took exception to are listed as um, requiring further coordination, mm -hmm. which is what we generally say when there are issues such as the um, concerns of the county that have not yet been resolved. Okay, so approval would not constitute a no. It approval of the document does not mean approval of the, the individual time. projects within it. Good. Thank you. Okay. Um, all in favor? Oh, is there a motion? Was there a motion? Is there a motion? So so moved. It's been moved and seconded on agenda item number five, which is the federal CIP for the National Capital Region. Um, all in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. It's adopted. Thank you. Agenda item number 5B is the National Museum of African American History and Culture. And Mr. Walton is here. I will note that on this, we will have to actually take two votes. The first vote will be on the record of decision, which will then have to and after that is acted on, then we can move on to the EDR proper. Mr. Walton. So good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and members of the commission. Today, the Smithsonian has submitted the preliminary design, uh, final site utilities, final support of excavation, excavation and dewatering of the site for the National Museum of African American History and Culture. Uh, since the revised concept submission last April, we have completed the NEPA final EIS, the environmental impact statement, completed a record of decision, Rod, the Smithsonian has finalized the NHPA Section 106 programmatic agreement, and they've begun to prepare the site for excavation. Now, since the Smithsonian does not have independent NEPA responsibilities, they've undertaken the NEPA with NCPC as a joint lead federal agency responsible. And so I'll be giving a, a brief summary of the NEPA process at the end of my presentation. We're also um, seeking the adoption of the Rod by the Commission as a part of this submission. Start with a little background. So as you know, the site is located here along Constitution Avenue between 14th and 15th Street and Madison Drive at the end of a row of existing museums on what was formerly the Washington Monument grounds. The operations and maintenance of the site were transferred to the Smithsonian by the Park Service this past September. The major building mass, the Corona, is located here, 234 feet off Constitution Avenue, uh, 138 feet off of 15th Street, 85 feet off 14th Street, and it varies between 140 and 100 feet off of Madison Drive, depending where you are along the slope. The service entrance is here off of 14th Street. <clears throat> the major entrance to the building is from the south off Madison, Dr Madison Drive here. And there's a secondary entrance off of Constitution Avenue on the north located here. At the revised concept uh, submission last April, the commission had several comments associated with different <laughs> aspects of the museum's design. Uh, those comments were related to the building's massing, the scale of the porch on the south side of the building, the night lighting, and the western skylight that was located along the edge of 15th Street. I'm going to go over each of these comments in the Smithsonian's response, starting with the building massing. So just a little bit more background. At the September 2010 commission meeting, the Smithsonian submitted a concept design that showed a corona with a width of 210 feet on all sides. Now, at that time, it was very early on in the design process, and the Smithsonian had not yet included uh, structure into the design. Once structure was included, the mass grew to about 220 feet on all sides. Now, this is what was submitted at the April revi uh, revised concept submission. At that time, the commission suggested that the Smithsonian either maintain this width of 220 feet 
or to the extent possible, try to reduce it back in the direction of the 210-foot submission. The current submission shows a corona with a width of 216 feet. The uh, red outline here represents the outline at the revised concept submission at 220 feet. The blue fill area in here is the current submission at 216. And so there's a difference of about four feet in reduction on all sides. Um, more importantly, however, the Smithsonian has been able to reduce the height of the building, not to exceed the height of the Commerce Building across the street. Uh, that was the height restriction that was agreed upon. At revised concept to the top of the penthouse here, the submission was at 129 and a half feet at revised concept, and the elevator overrides mechanical systems and skylights took it to 132 feet. That was about seven feet higher than the Commerce Building here. The current submission shows the design with the Skylights, elevator overrides, and mechanical systems just in line or just below, five inches below the top of the Commerce Building, and the corona in line with the top of the parapet of the Commerce Building, so well within the guidance that's been given. Now, that was accomplished by modifying the skylights, the elevator overrides, and mechanical systems not to exceed the height restriction, and then capping those with decorative louvered panels uh, so that when viewed from above, say from the top of the Washington Monument, the roof appears as a fifth facade. <coughs> There's also been a parapet wall that's been added around the perimeter of the mechanical system. So when viewed from the pedestrian level, as it is here in this uh, April submission, these skylights now disappear. So this is a view of the current submission, the preferred alternative, the, refi the refined pavilion two from the intersection of Constitution Avenue and 14th Street looking back across the site to the Washington Monument. Uh, second, the porch. And so at the revised concept submission, the commissioners uh, suggested that the Smithsonian study the porch from the south side, from the mall side of the building. Uh, more specifically, they suggested that the Smithsonian study the scale of the porch and possibly find ways of reducing it. Uh, the Smithsonian uh, responded by carrying out a reduction study, looking at different reduction scenarios for the, for the porch. Uh, this scheme is the revised concept submission. And you can see here the legs of the porch are in line with the edge of the corona. So the width of the porch at this point was at 220 feet, and it was 50 feet in depth. The first reduction scenario brings the legs of the porch in line with the glass base at the bottom of the museum in 10 feet from each side, so uh, 20 feet total reduction in width, and bringing it back to 44 feet in depth. The next reduction scenario brings the legs of the porch in, with, in line with the outer edge of the building core here. I'm not sure you can see the core, but it's just in that line. And the third reduction scenario brings the legs of the porch in line with the inner edge of the building core right in here. In the end, the Smithsonian selected the design that put the legs of the porch in line with the glass base at the bottom of the corona, uh, creating a more streamlined, better proportioned uh, masking overall. <coughs> the porch does, however, still extend into the McMillan setback line on the south side of the site. It is, however, two feet shorter than the portico of the Natural History Museum. And it has been scaled down from the 220 by 50 to where it is now at 200 by 44. Um, also, the occupiable space here does not extend beyond the McMillan setback line, only the green roof here, which provides the opportunity to create a microclimate beneath uh, the porch between the extension and the water element below. On the night lighting, so at revised concept, the commissioners asked that the Smithsonian carry out a more detailed night lighting study. Uh, the Smithsonian responded by first setting up a set of lighting goals that included being a good neighbor, uh, providing a link to the museum's daytime appearance, supporting the building's uh, role as a center of life and activity, and meeting the project's sustainability goals. By being a good neighbor, what the Smithsonian meant was uh, being consistent with the lighting levels of the other museums along the mall and the museums around the mall, and not competing with the major landmarks like the Washington Monument and the Capitol Dome. Uh, also, you can see here that the Smithsonian has carried out a candle study and that the lighting level design intent for the museum is at, at a lower level than all the other museums on the mall, except the Herschel one, which is at zero. Um, the lighted water features and landscape features are indirectly lit, and this is designed to provide for uh, destinations in the nighttime landscape. Here, a uh, corona panel is backlit. Uh, to give you an idea of the design and tent lighting level for the museum as compared to other museums and other buildings around the site. And you can see that it's about the same lighting level or just below many of the other buildings. So in the end, the Smithsonian has consistently worked with the uh, review agencies and the consulting parties on the lighting requirements and will continue working with the lighting designer throughout the, remaining of the remainder of the design process. 
going to the western skylight. So I revised concept the Smithsonian submitted a design that showed a, a skylight here along the western edge of the site near 15th Street. Uh, this skylight was 100 feet long and 25 feet deep. It was designed to bring light into a lower level cafeteria space that was located here. At the time, the, the commissioners suggested that the Smithsonian consider scaling down the size of the uh, skylight because of its uh, relationship to the Washington Monument grounds and to the monument itself. In the current submission here to the right, the skylight has been removed. The uh, cafeteria has moved to the east side of the building and a light well has been provided in a previously designed egress courtyard here, which is below grade. Yes, sir. What was specifically objectionable to the skylight relative to the Washington Monument? The size of it, because it was going to be visible from the Washington Monument grounds. It didn't look like it was a part of the natural landscape of the Washington Monument grounds. Okay. Uh, on to the landscape design. So at, the landscape design has probably evolved the most since the revised concept. Um, the rain garden that's located here has been redesigned to be more in keeping with the more formal aspects of the Constitution Avenue here. You can see that curbs and paving have been added to create a year-round aquatic garden rather than a rain garden, which was thought to be more uh, marshy or um, suburban. The oculus here has moved in tighter to the face of the building and serves now as a welcoming entrance feature on the north side of the site. It's also a vertical element that will be a um, uh, fountain in the, in the summertime and will serve as a clear story in the winter. Um, there's also been an addition of some themed reading groves added to the north side and around the perimeter of the site. These are pretty conceptual diagrams, but these benches would be carved stone benches that would be based around the themes that have been created by the museum. On the east side of the building, a new zone has been added along the edge of the um, service entrance. On the north side, a new guard house and bike rack has been added that's integrated into the uh, retaining wall <coughs> here. And on the south side, the cafe concept that was an er earlier design alternative has returned. It now features an outdoor seating area here, which is here, uh, with low planting and a new shelter that will conceal a movable food cart right in here. On the, further down on the south side, the south water element has also been modified. <coughs> it now features a raised edge provide additional security and also a space for visitor seating. Uh, the slope side of it here would be covered with the inscriptions that would talk about African Americans from all walks of life. Uh, the pool element here, when drained in the wintertime, the base would, uh, be con would contain uh, quotes from famous writers, and so the entire south side element would be a year-round feature. Uh, onto the corona. <coughs> So you may recall from the revised concept that the designers have been using precedents from African American Ironworks grills as an inspiration for the design of the corona panels. They had taken the patterns and abstracted it and triangulated it here and created a more modern panel that was then arrayed across the surface of the building. Um, the openings in these panels modulated between about 65% open and 90% open for view control and solar control. Uh, currently, the designers are looking at a more three-dimensional panel. This is still very early on in the design process, but they wanted looking at something that had more of a, the feel of uh, cast bronze. <coughs> so you can get a sense here what that would look like if it was arrayed across the surface of the building. But again, this is very early on in the design process, so there's more to come on that. Uh, the geotechnical conditions. So at Revised Concept, uh, the commission suggested that the Smithsonian advance their geotechnical studies, and they have. I'm going to start with the flooding studies. The Smithsonian has looked at two flooding conditions, the 100-year flood and the 500-year flood condition. They have two solutions, one for each condition. For the 100-year flood, they're going to have automatic flood gates here at the, t at the base of the loading dock area. <coughs> and the guardhouse and the uh, oculus would both uh, find, have uh, be weatherproof for 500-year floods. Around the perimeter of the building, they use sandbags and movable uh, panels. Smithsonian has also been carrying out seismic monitoring to study the impacts of pile driving, the vibration from pile, pile driving on the site. Uh, the triangular elements that you see here uh, are the locations of the different monitors where they've been placed. The circular numbered areas here are the monuments and the buildings that are being monitored. And you can see from the initial pile test that the vibration levels are coming in much lower than the standards that were set and agreed upon by the agencies. The Smithsonian is also submitting for a supportive excavation, final supportive excavation, excavation and dewatering of the site. 
Uh, this work is scheduled to start in mid-February and should go on for about a year. It's a little bit weather dependent, so it could go on for longer. Um, the work entails uh, creating a trench six feet wide and 100 feet <coughs> deep that will wrap the perimeter of the site. That trench would be, then be filled with concrete. Once the concrete is cured, the earth and the water will be re removed and the foundation, which is here, you see this little outline here is the foundation will be built within the perimeter of the supportive excavation wall. Get a better view of what that is. This is the supportive excavation wall here, the blue line. The foundation is here. There's about an eight, five to eight foot difference between the two. And so starting this work would not preclude further design of the museum itself. Uh, the Smithsonian is also submitting for final site <coughs> utilities. This has several elements. Uh, the first, this red line here, represents a 1890s water line that needs to be replaced along uh, 14th Street between Madison and Constitution. Uh, this work would require the street to be opened. Uh, it would be still, it would, the work would occur at night and we still played it over in the day so that traffic could continue to move. Um, in addition, there's work, direct bores that need to occur between the African American Museum site and the American History site underneath 14th Street. Uh, this is for condenser water lines, uh, data transmission lines, and telecommunication lines. And here on the northwest corner, there's additional uh, water line work that needs to occur. It's going to be similar to the work on 14th Street, so it will require the street to be open. The work would occur at night and still played it over in the daytime <coughs> so traffic could continue. All other utility work will occur within the perimeter of the site. Now this work it will begin as soon as the Smithsonian is authorized by permitting agencies to start. The Smithsonian is continuing to work with DDOT and the Park Service on those permits. And we'll get more from that, hear more from that later. The NEPA summary. So I just wanted to give a quick summary of the NEPA process for the museum. Uh, NCPC requires the a completed NEPA at the time of the uh, um, preliminary design phase. Um, the work, the NEPA process itself was carried out by both NCPC and, and the Smithsonian. It was a joint NEPA process with NCPC as the lead federal agency in charge. Uh, it, um, the program was broken into two tiers. The tier one EIS was basically focusing on programmatic issues while the tier two EIS focused on specific design issues. In addition to the physical parameters of the building, the museum also created a set of design principles that the designers have used throughout the design process to mitigate against advert, to mitigate and minimize adverse effects um, related to historic and natural resources, views, spatial arrangement of the mall, scale, and historic content. The approach to this was to create six <coughs> massing uh, schemes that would arrange the museum's program in, in different configurations across the site to see how the uh, height, bulk, mass, and setback infect, affected views and environment. Um, there was also a no-build alternative um, that was the environmentally preferred alternative but did not meet the Smithsonian's purpose and need. Uh, you can see here what these alternatives were. It was a simple mass in the center of the site representing height and bulk. Um, two that represented geometry and the possibility of opening views across the site. Um, a, a scheme that represented sort of the topo of terrain and how the relationship of the topo to the massing of the building. A scheme that broke the building into two buildings with the opening in between and a smaller building that could be located and pushed into a corner of a site. You see here what those masses look like. And here are the studies, the visual studies from different uh, station points, looking at many of the station points we've seen throughout the uh, submission process from the corner of 14th and Constitution, from the base of the monument, looking back across the mall towards the site, and from 15th Street. There were many other studies along the way. <coughs> the Tier 2 EIS focused on specific design issues leading to uh, the preferred alternative, which is now the, the Refined Pavilion 2. Like the Tier 1, it dealt with many of the same issues, environmental resources, historic resources, visual resources, uh, short and long-term construction, long-term occupational issues, and cumulative impacts. The Refined Pavilion 2 evolved from the refinement of the, pav the Pavilion Scheme and the Refined Pavilion Scheme and several other schemes along the way. So just to give you an idea of what this looks like visually, you may remember this scheme, which was the winning competition entry scheme. Within this, you can see several elements that still remain in the, in the current design, the porch, the corona, the bronze color. Uh, these were called irreducible elements by the Smithsonian and have remained in all the alternatives throughout the design process. Uh, the process for tier two consisted of three design alternatives. The plinth scheme, which is very similar to the winning competition scheme. The plaza scheme, which took the gallery space and separated it from the administrative space with the plaza. And the pavilion scheme, which took the main mass of the building, the corona, and placed it at grade on site. And so the plinth, 
the plaza and the pavilion scheme, went through several iterations to the refined pavilion, which led to where they are today, and <coughs> the preferred alternative, the refined pavilion two. And so the tier two rod documents the decision by NCPC and the Smithsonian to implement the tier, the refined pavilion two. Uh, within this decision, all practical means to avoid, minimize environmental harm have been adopted. However, certain impacts are unavoidable. The tier two rod documents more than 50 mitigation measures by which, which have been identified uh, relating to the full range of impacts, both man-made and natural. And the tier two rod obligates the Smithsonian to monitor the implementation of these mitigation measures. <coughs> and so, Mr. Chairman, the commission is being asked to take two separate actions, as you mentioned earlier. The first is to adopt the record of decision, the rod. The second is to approve the preliminary design, the final site utilities, and the final support of excavation, excavation, and uh, dewatering of the site. And so the executive director recommends that the commission notes that in the development of the final EIS for the National Museum of African American History and Culture, that the Smithsonian has responded to the commission's comments and recommendations on the museum's design, Notes that as a requirement of the Section 106 programmatic agreement that the Smithsonian will continue to consult with the DC SHPO, uh, the review agencies and consulting parties in order to avoid, minimize, and mitigate adverse effects to historic properties. Notes that the uh, National Museum of African American History and Culture is based on the preferred alternative analyzed in the joint EIS and record of decision. And so the executive director, re director recommends that the commission adopt the record of decision for the National Museum of African American History and Culture. So with that, Turn it over to you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. The first vote is on the rod itself, the record of decision. It has come at the end of the NEPA process, and NCPC is the agency in this particular case. Um, there has been a motion to approve uh, the record of decision. Is there a second? Second. Any further discussion on the rod? Hearing none, all in favor of adopting the record of decision for the... Sorry. Could you share with us, please, the, uh, the, the... It looks like more than 50 environmental considerations have been addressed and mitigated. Could you highlight for us, if you will, the number, the scope, the impact of the ones that could not be mitigated? That what could not be mitigated? Yeah. Well, I can tell you some that have... Uh, for example, for views across the site, the building yes. is pretty good mass, and so sure. they've made the glass at the base of the building as transparent as possible. They provide it for views within the building out to the site. Uh, the skin of the building itself is going to be somewhat opaque, but there will be openings in the skin so that you can see some key views. That can't totally be mitigated, but it, they're trying their best. Um, one of the issues is that all the trees on the site will be removed, but they're going to be replaced with trees of the same caliber. Um, this is a... Uh, First Amendment protest site, which it will not be once the Smithsonian takes it over to be a Smithsonian Museum site. So those are key things that can't totally be resolved, but there is, they're trying to mitigate them as best as possible. Okay, good. Thank you. Other questions? Hearing none, the, um, it's been moved and seconded. All in favor of adopting the record of decision say aye. 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 Opposed, no. The record of decision is adopted. Now for part two. Okay, so the executive director recommends that the commission approve the preliminary site and building plans, the final site utility plans, the final support of excavation. Am I on the right page there? <coughs> the final support of excavation, um, excavation and dewatering of the site for the National Museum of African American History and Culture, and commends the Smithsonian for the reduction in the size of the building, the reduction in the size of the south porch, the redesign of the north side water feature, and the elimination of the west skylight and for conducting an extensive public outreach during the development of the design. The commission recommends that as the design continue, that as the refinement of the food cart continue and the guard booth design continues, that the Smithsonian continue to co coordinate with NCPC staff and other federal review agencies, and that they continue to coordinate with the District Department of Transportation and the National Park Service to assure that the 14th Street and 15th Street sidewalks are reopened as soon as construction safety permits and that they continue to coordinate with all other outstanding construction issues throughout the process. With that, Mr. Chairman, that concludes my presentation. Thank you, Mr. Walton. Is there questions or discussions on uh, this part of the EDR? Uh, Ms. Tregoni? Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I just wanted to acknowledge that um, uh, 
there have been good and productive conversations between the Smithsonian and the and the city regarding transportation issues. Uh, but I did want to offer um, an amendment to the EDR that just uh, references a couple of the other things that I think are important to acknowledge with respect to the need for permits uh, for the for this. And I do appreciate the and 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 heartily concur with the idea that uh, we work with the. Park Service and the Smithsonian to make sure that the sidewalks on 14th and 15th Street are reopened to the public as soon as possible. We're, we're, we are very concerned about that. May I pass out a copy Please. of the language? Mr. Chairman, point of order. Yes, sir. Uh, are we, is this an amendment? Is there anything on the floor for this to amend? Um, I haven't uh, yes. yet moved a proposal to amend, but I will in okay. just a moment. But I'm saying there's nothing on the table for this to amend. Do we have to move it first in order we, to? We do. Parliamentary, we need to move we it. We do. Okay. Not this, so we can amend it. All right. Is there a, I'm happy to move the EDR. Is there a motion on the EDR? It's been moved move and second. It's been moved and seconded. Uh, all in favor of the? Well, it's been moved. Yeah, don't and don't do that yet. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Getting ahead of myself. Now we accept the amendment, right? Right. The amendment. So I'll just read the amendment so Please. that. Um, it, and it would be in addition to what's in here. So it, it would be a new note. Notes that the Smithsonian must obtain from the District of Columbia all permits required by district or, or law or regulations for the temporary occupancy of and permanent alterations to public space under the jurisdiction of the District of Columbia and include terms addressing the assumption of liability. Mr. Chairman, I would accept that as a motion to the executive right recommendation. I would accept it as a motion. It's been moved. The amendment's been moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Now let's discuss the amendment. <laughs> Mr. Chairman? Mr. May? Um, as I understand it, some of the, I mean, the, this amendment um, makes, well, implies certain assumptions about the jurisdiction of the sidewalks. And I think it's appropriate for the commission to have some discussion of the issue there if we're going to actually amend the EDR. Yep. So I, I, don't, I don't know the ins and outs of that. Well, Perhaps the an, staff can. An, yeah, anticipating this uh, matter, we have done some research. And let me call on Ms. Skyle, our legal counsel, to give us a bit of an overview. I think you're right, Mr. May. I think what is um, implied here is some jurisdiction, a, a district jurisdiction over public space. And most particularly in the last few weeks, the issue has been whether or not the district has jurisdiction over the sidewalk on the site. And in response to that issue, I have been privy to a legal opinion prepared by the Smithsonian Institute's, Institution's General Counsel. Um, I've been privy to legal opinions prepared by Park Service General Counsel. Um, I've been, our agency has been advised of a map that the District of Columbia has that shows a line inside the curb line. And I've also done my own independent research. And I think... Are we talking about just 14th Street or 14th yes, and 15th? Yes, just the sidewalk on 14th Street. That seems to be all that has ever really been at issue. And I think based on all of this, I'm forced to say that the district probably doesn't have an interest in the public space in the sidewalk along 14th Street. And the, I, if you'd like, I'll explain the basis I'm sorry, of that. you said does not. Does not, yeah. does not, does not. And the reason for that, to, to it's my, my opinion that the central question here is, what did Congress intend by its description of the site it included in Public Law 108184, which was the law that provided, f f offered five sites to the Smithsonian. And in particular, the subject site was described as the area bounded by Constitution Avenue, Madison Drive, and 14 and 15 Streets Northwest. Now, um, generally rules of interpretation, you try to ascertain meaning based on what's contained within the law. But uh, in this particular instance, since public space does have different meaning from a technical planning perspective versus a lay perspective, I did pursue the issue further. And specifically what I looked at was a report that was prepared by the, a congressional, a presidential commission, which was created at the outset of the 
process for this museum to advise Congress on various issues, including what sites would be suitable for the museum. Excuse me, can I just interrupt for a second just to make the point that, that I didn't raise the issue to have the NCPC establish the jurisdiction. I just raised the issue to suggest that any public space that is determined to be under the jurisdiction of the District of Columbia uh, would be subject to the public space permitting requirements, et cetera. It doesn't make any assertions one way or the other. It just says lands determined to be under the jurisdiction. That's, that's really it. And, and we wouldn't look to NCPC. I would suggest respectfully that, it, that this is not the venue to make those jurisdictional Agreed. decisions. Agreed. Agreed. Chairman, point of order, point of procedure. We have a motion on the floor to accept the report as represented by the exact director. We now have an amendment to that, which the motion, I, I'm the maker of the motion. I, I moved that to be a friendly amendment. There has not been any, you know, seconding to that. So I'm assuming this is a separate amendment to this now. I still think it's friendly because, as, as you said, this is not extending any jurisdiction over the public. Correct. Just saying we need to be, as a city, from a home rule and a public safety, et cetera, et cetera, at least cooperate with. And that's all it suggests, I think. I think it's very friendly. It, well, it begs the question of who has the jurisdiction because our various lawyers are looking at this right now. But yet this matter is before us. The district very much does not want to delay um, moving forward with the museum. Exactly. And this is how we propose to resolve it as, as opposed to opposing an approval while these jurisdictional issues get resolved. So I'm assuming, Mr. Chairman, procedurally, there is not a, the second did not agree to this as a federal amendment. Well, so I have to deal with it separately. We, we will deal with it separately. I think, okay. I think the discussion is to determine its friendliness. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and it's not, it's not an appropriate discussion, so I'm, we can well, proceed. I, I'm not trying to cut off the discussion. It's okay. Amendment, but I just think that we need to understand procedure where we are. We, the motion, move, mover of the, of the motion, I moved it. It was seconded. And I, I accepted it as a, as a friendly amendment. If it's not viewed as friendly, then we have to, as you suggest, discuss the, the merits of the, of the amendment. Uh, I'm receptive to that. Okay. So be sure where we are. Then let's continue with the discussion. You may. Thank you. Um, if this jurisdiction, it, if the lawyers all decide that the jurisdiction is the districts, is there any reason to believe that the Smithsonian would not need to obtain the permits and follow the laws and regulations of the district? If the lawyers decide that the sidewalks are under the jurisdiction of the District of Columbia, they would have to get public space permits. They are in the process now of trying to obtain those permits. I think, again, everyone wants this project to move forward without knowing that this jurisdictional issue is not yet resolved. So I'm not entirely clear on why the NCPC would need to support this language. I'm not saying it's necessarily... Nothing's happen happened yet. Uh, I mean, if, if not, you know, none of the permits have yet been issued, the coordination is, is continuing, but this process is not complete. This is to just say... Uh, that, that we believe that until these issues are resolved, we should continue to uh, uh, provide for the normal pr due process that is associated with the closure of a public sidewalk. I'm not sure that I, I under, I'm not sure that this would do that as you've drafted it. I don't, I don't see that. I mean, if you'd like the site to get the permits while the jurisdictional battle is going on, that's, begs the question I mean I can't I can't require them to get a permit you know for, right. where we don't have jurisdiction right. I'm just saying that to the extent that we do they'll need a permit right and just advising which, I mean, of that is already agreed upon by sort of everybody right it's just noting it for the record okay. why isn't that covered in the last uh, paragraph the continuing coordination it doesn't say anything about permits it just says coordination, which I, 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 I'm not supposing, uh, I'm not suggesting that we eliminate that language. No. I like that language. This is a, to add just another note to the EDR. Mr. May? Oh. I'm just curious about whether Ms. Schuyler was done in her explanation, because I was interested in hearing it. I mean, I just, I before like I come to any conclusion about it, I'd like to understand. Right, I'm with you. I'd like to hear context. a little bit more from Ms. Schuyler. I, I, can I just say that 
that we, you know, we didn't know that there was going to be a legal discussion. We would have brought, in our, brought our general counsel so that we could put forward some of the, of, of the district's theories on why it's different. But I'll, I'll just go again, go on the record with, yeah. with that concern. I think we're entitled to hear from our counsel. Okay. Um, anyway, I, I was interested in what the intent was. What did Congress mean by the phrase bounded by um, Constitution Avenue, Madison Drive, 14th and 15th Street? So I looked to this report that was prepared by the Presidential Commission that was created at the outset of the museum process. And they were created to advise Congress on a number of, a number of issues associated with the creation of a museum to include an appropriate site. So in that report, they in fact noted, uh, which was called The Time Has Come, and it's very interesting. I would recommend it to your reading. Um, they, they, um, they recommended an, they five sites. They, they came up with five sites. Now it's interesting, this is not the preferred site, but it was one known as the monument site that was included in the recommendation. And for each of the sites, uh, the report contained a description it contained uh, a brief analysis or massing study of whether the museum's programmatic needs could be met on a particular site. But I think more importantly, for each site, it had a map. And the site was denoted around the curb with a boundary, which leads you to conclude that what was meant and what Congress had before it and what it meant was that the sites that were to be offered to the Smithsonian were curb to curb. Now. If the district had a valid interest in the site prior to passage of public law 108-184, Congress negated that interest or extinguished that interest as the ultimate legislative authority when it offered that site to the museum. If it did, even if for the sake of argument you said that it did not, if there was no interest in existence at the time of passage, the only way an interest could come into being was for an express congressional enactment. And all of this derives from the Home Rule Act, particularly that Congress is the ultimate legislative authority, number one, and number two, the council has no authority to enact, amend, or repeal a federal law. So it either had an interest that was extinguished or it would have to get an interest after the fact. And I think that based on um, other information, presented to me from the Park Service and Smithsonian that the property was held by, Smith's, by Park Service from curb to curb, and that is, in fact, what the Park Service transferred to the Smithsonian. Can I ask a couple of follow-ups? Um, for the other sites that were listed in, the, um, uh, in that study, did it also show, show curb to curb dimensions on all of the other ones? Where there was a curb, yes. Okay, Some so of the, one was, of the sites, I think, didn't have a curb, so they had to kind of just bring it down the middle. And didn't that have a curb, okay. Um, well, um, was the Banneker Overlook site included in that, in that study? It was. Do you, okay. Um, that was my recollection that it was. I don't, I don't. Yeah. Wait, uh, wait. You know, I'm just curious because the, the, the circumstance here on 14th Street is a little bit different, I think, from some of the other sites. Maybe not all the other sites. I don't remember what the other sites were. Um, and the reason the Park Service had jurisdiction over the sidewalk, as I understand it, has to do with the fact that when we own the property on both sides of the street, then we control the sidewalk. That is Dis correct. District still controls the right of way. That, that is. And that's a matter of law. Yeah. yeah. That's codified in DC law. That right. is correct. And so in some of these other sites, it might not have been the same circumstance. Possibly. I don't yeah. know. Um, and the other question I have is, do you know whether, I mean, I, I, can't, I don't recall the, I've, I've looked at the jurisdiction map or the transfer map and I don't recall. Um, did, did, we didn't, did, did the Park Service transfer jurisdiction for the sidewalk along um, Constitution? Curb to curb. All the way to Constitution? Okay. Because we didn't have jurisdiction over that as far as I understand it. I mean, maybe I'm looking at the wrong maps, but I don't think that was necessarily ours in that circumstance. The other ones we did. I'm not, I'd have to go back and check the map, but yeah. the description was, curb, what the Park Service gave was curb to curb. Yeah, well, it's, it's, it's clear that it's, it's, it's kind of a murky issue. Yeah. All right. Uh, second, um, acknowledging this is not uh, a legal matter we need to weigh into and that that will be covered in, by other parties and other venues, I would like to ask, based on your, you've done analysis and you've 
seen the Smithsonian's analysis and you've been privy to the Park Service's analysis, what did the others conclude in terms of, or did they, in terms of uh, sidewalk jurisdiction? Uh, both the Park Service and the Smithsonian. Well, the Smithsonian concluded it was under their jurisdiction. What I saw from the Park Service was an assessment. Um, the District Department of Transportation was looking into regulating Segway usage, Segway usage of sidewalks. And so they had approached the uh, National Park Service about certain cross mall sidewalks. And they, in that particular letter, the Park Service, in that particular legal analysis that was returned to the district, the Park Service um, addressed the issue and said that they had 14th Street. Interestingly enough, apparently in the incoming letter to the Park Service, the district disclaimed any interest in the 14th Street sidewalk. Okay. Uh, Ms. Who wants to go first? Mr. Hart. Go ahead. Um, I just wanted to echo what uh, uh, Commissioner Tregoning said, that there have been um, very uh, productive discussions between um, the uh, District Department of Transportation and the, and the, and the Smithsonian uh, addressing the concerns that they had. There are permits that the, are pending at the District Department of Transportation. The, uh, clearly. Smithsonian thinks that the district has jurisdiction over something related to this project because they're waiting for the permits to be uh, issued. Um, but I would also echo the uh, uh, Mr. Groning's uh, comment that this isn't pre predetermining what the jurisdictional issue is, um, and uh, it's just acknowledging that there is that, that there is there is a juris jurisdictional issue and that there are permits pending. And that uh, in, it's in the context of those pending permits that the, that the Smithsonian and, D, and D, DDOT are working out uh, the concerns uh, that, that need to be addressed. I would also note that the district has, uh, if, if the federal government had such an interest in the, um, these sidewalks, uh, that they should have been repairing them uh, all these years. And maybe they need to compensate the district for whatever expenses have been paid. Uh, has the Park Service? been repairing these sidewalks? You know, I, I don't know, I don't have a complete inventory of all of our sidewalks and the extent to which we repair them, but if we know them to be in our jurisdiction, generally we repair them. And if there is ever a question about it. Have you ever repaired the sidewalk? I, I don't know. I don't know if we have or we haven't. But it's, we know it was in our jurisdiction for law enforcement purposes and maintenance purposes and everything else. Sidewalk clearing, snow clearing. But you acknowledge that you haven't been, been necessarily No, I did not acknowledge anything about what we have or haven't done. I don't know what we haven't, have or have not done in terms of repairing the sidewalk. Um, but we were aware that it was in our jurisdiction, as we are aware that, that all, you know, sidewalks of 7th Street, which is an, uh, a roadway that's district jurisdiction, we have those sidewalks and we are, uh, those are in our jurisdiction. I don't know what we've done to maintain them, but we know they're in our jurisdiction. Um, can well, we're I happy to be repairing uh, the sidewalks that are in your jurisdiction all these years. The, um, you, uh, uh, Mr. Goni suggested that, there, uh, that we're talking about public space that's been determined to be under the jurisdiction of the District of Columbia. That actual wording isn't in there. No, no. As determined to be. No, no. I, the, correct. It, it doesn't say one way or the other. Right. That any public space that is under the jurisdiction, we're not asserting that it is. We're just saying if it's under the jurisdiction, right. then they need permits. That's really all. We're not I'm, trying to resolve in any underhanded way. No, no. I, I, I wasn't suggesting okay. that. Okay. I'm just I, saying well, I don't, I don't no. want us to resolve the jurisdictional question or attempt to in this forum. That's and all. I, and I'm not suggesting we would either. By any means, Clearly I just wanted, I wanted people to understand what the, the yes. issue is. Um, I, I mean, frankly, I would be more, if we're going to speak on this at all, I think some acknowledgement of the fact that there's a question may be appropriate and to say simply that it's alterations to public space as determined to be under the jurisdiction of the District of Columbia. I would also, if we were to consider this amendment, strike the last phrase because you know, what's included in a permit and what's not is really, really not in our domain. And I just, you know, if they need permits, they need permits. The terms of the permits are what the district decides them to be and negotiates with whoever seeks the permit. 
It's not our business. You know, I, I think we're getting sidetracked on an issue that doesn't really need this kind of discussion. What's before us is pretty straightforward. What Commissioner Tregoning put on the table is being redundant and duplicative of what's already out there. So there shouldn't be any issues with that. She's just laying claim to what is the district's uh, pur purview on this. So I'm, I'm happy to move along. Is there any further discussion? I, I would just point out that I don't believe the amendment is redundant. This talks about coordination, which might happen regardless of any jurisdictional issue versus the need to get permits, which is a function of a jurisdictional issue that I'm not attempting to resolve in this meeting. But I, I appreciate the comment. Thank you. So the question before us, hearing no further discussion, the question before us is the amendment offered by Ms. Uh, Commissioner Tregoning. Um, it's been moved and seconded, right? All in favor of that amendment, say aye. 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 Opposed, no. No. Two no's. Okay, the amendment is adopted. Now we're back to the EDR as amended. Any further discussion on the EDR? I would just like to speak in strongly in favor of the EDR and this project. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> so the question now is on the EDR as amended. All in favor say aye. Hold on, hold on, hold on. I'm sorry. I didn't think we were done with the discussion I'm of sorry. the EDR. Okay. We just addressed one issue. Because I have a few things I have to say, although I'm not okay. going to oppose the, the EDR. The, um, um, first of all, I appreciate the evolution of the design so far. It was especially helpful seeing the reminder of where this whole thing started because it really was um, uh, had a lot more impact in the earliest versions of the design so um, seeing it where how far it's come I think was very helpful uh, and most recently the elimination of the skylights and the reduction of the porch are helpful moves um, I think that uh, when it comes to the porch itself uh, further reduction actually um, would be appropriate I'm not saying that we need to take any action on that line today um, but I think that the, the, the drawings that, or the, the images, uh, images that showed us the three different versions of the porches, the second one actually I thought was, was quite compelling and it showed more of the corona from the front of the building and actually was, it was I thought, a more powerful <coughs> image. But I will take that up in, in the other form in which we can further discuss this since this is just preliminary and there'll be further coordination before final. Um, the, uh, I also wanted to note that the, the view that you showed from across Constitution, that lovely rendered view, mm -hmm. which shows the corona and only the corona, um, I don't think is, is truly accurate because we're missing there the piece of the penthouse um, and the pen, uh, that, that one. Um, I, you know, I've looked at, at the, what the sight lines ought to be from that penthouse down. Um, and I think that penthouse is, viewable, is, is visible from all sides of the sidewalk on the site based on the, the diagrams of the building that I've seen. And I just think it's unfortunate. I think the, the penthouse grew larger as, the, as the, the overall envelope got narrower. And I think it's unfortunate because I think it diminishes the, the power of this image to see that um, penthouse popping out. Um, I also think that the landscape design needs further refinement. We seem to be going through phases of, of, of um, you know, dressing it up and then calming it down a little bit and then dressing it up again. And we just went through another dressing up and I think that's still a little bit too fussy and, and a bit incompatible with the rest of the context. Again, matters that I will take up in another forum, but I wanted to make sure they were mentioned here. So um, that's it in terms of my comments. Otherwise, I'm prepared to move forward. Mr. Gunn. Excuse me, just very briefly. Um, I, I just wanted to comment on um, uh, uh, just one observation about the evolution of the design, uh, particularly as it concerns the landscape. I'm very appreciative of the efforts that have been made by the designers to activate that space and to create many, many different opportunities for people to experience um, this historic landscape. Um, and the, this wonderful new museum in, in a, from a lot of different perspectives and, uh, and a lot of different types of activity. And it's something that is, uh, that's an absolute addition to this corner of the mall uh, that I think is, is excellent and I look forward to its continued evolution. But in particular, I, uh, I noted uh, the many different ways in which uh, the public and the public space can be engaged uh, by visitors to uh, the museum and to the surrounding mall. Thank you. Mr. Chairman. 
I also want to uh, thank the, the, the presenters of this, the staff, as well as the folks from the uh, museum in Smithsonian. Did a, lot of, did a lot of movement has happened. A lot of cooperation has happened. And I think you've come a long way, and I, I'm, I'm, I'm impressed. And I will tell you this, that uh, I kind of like a big porch. So we're going to have a debate on that one we're not in this other form that was coming forward because, you know, big porches are big things in a lot of places to be able to. <laughs> to be, I don't, you know, I like it. Like, anyhow, thank you very much for what you all have done. And Mr. Prevention. Let, let me start with some of the, uh, the, my, the concerns and then uh, conclude with uh, things that I think are uh, laudatory that should, uh, should be mentioned. Uh, let's uh, start with the porch. I echo the sentiments of, uh, of Mr. May. Um, two feet. We're just asking for two feet. The, I'm talking about the encroachment of two feet into the Madison, Avenue, uh, Madison Drive uh, uh, right of way. One other aspect of the porch is the, uh, the knife edge uh, design is very, very stark. Clearly we'll discuss design in, in other forums, but just a, a, a f some feedback on that. One alternative proposal might be to respect the 17-degree uh, angled platforms of, uh, of the levels of the corona that was highlighted in one of our earlier presentations, perhaps at the, perhaps at the April meeting, that the, those angles were determined in respect for the adjacent uh, Washington Monument, which we thought was uh, highly commendary. <coughs> so, um, Concerned about the knife edge design and the two feet of encroachment. Don't have any problems with the uh, with the width of the, the full, almost full width. Concerned a little bit about 500-year uh, uh, floodplain. Uh, almost 700 feet of sandbags doesn't seem like a an optimal solution for a building of this stature and uh, grandeur in the event of a 500-year flood. Might look at some other design options. Concerned also about the uh, panel design. Looked like. Uh, we started with uh, beautiful wrought irons, reminiscent of the South, New Orleans in particular, and we've started to step away from that. It's, that strikes us as, uh, as unfortunate. At the meeting in, in April, there was uh, five recommendations from the staff, and I think almost all of them have been covered. Geotechnical solutions, the night lighting, the west skylight, the building massing, and so forth. Did we cover uh, access, uh, service access, and the impacts on the east courtyard, the 85-foot setback? Well, it was covered during the April submission, and I thought it was resolved at that point. Okay. Um, is it resolved satisfactorily to the uh, satisfaction of the staff that we've respected the 80-foot foot? And is there any um, further implications with the movement of the cafeteria to that side of the building and the addition of a skylight? Okay, so I understand. Your first question, I think the answer is that... Well, the, let me re re okay. re refresh your memory on the language. Refined service access and east courtyard to ensure all elements on the east side of the building fit within the 85-foot setback and that no additional changes would need to be made to the building's position to accommodate the service drive and egress changes. Right, so no changes so, have been made. Nothing is needed to, to, to change that. Right. What happened was that there were two Even subsequent to the change of the cafeteria shifting it over? Right, nothing changed. Nothing the, changed. Position okay. of the building. Right. What happened was that there were two different measurements, one from the top of the building and one from the bottom of the building, mm -hmm. and there was some confusion as, as to where the measurement was being taken from. So there was no <coughs> movement of the building, <coughs> just the movement of where the measurement was being taken from. Got it. Then to uh, conclude, uh, tremendous progress, as uh, other commissioners have uh, noted. Uh, the massing is now reduced. Uh, we asked for 10 feet. We got uh, 4 feet. Step in the right direction. The accommodation of the height, uh, adjusting the height to the adjacent co commerce building, good. Night lighting, good. Sky lighting, good. Landscaping, the water features, the uh, reading areas, wonderful additions. And the preservation of the three, what were described as irreducible elements. Sustaining the corona, the porch design, and the bronze color. All are very, very positive uh, improvements since, uh, since the last presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Hart. Uh, at, at a previous presentation, I had expressed uh, some concerns about the night lighting effects. And I really appreciate the advances that have been made to tone down the, the lighting and bring it more in the context of, the, of its neighbors and respecting the Washington Monument. So I compliment the Smithsonian's progress. Comment, if I could. We look forward to the engineering solutions, the uh, the very complex foundation system, the dewatering challenges that the, the designers face. Uh, we're looking forward to seeing some innovative solutions to those uh, challenges. Hearing no 
hearing one more additional comment. <laughs> um, I, I am also going to join the chorus of thanking you for responding to the comments um, and, and um, be your cheerleader just one more time for the, um, for the water element on Constitution Avenue, which I think is, is um, really critical. I know other people find it to be a foreign sort of uh, entity on Constitution Avenue. I completely disagree and would encourage you to hang in. Um, it's really important for the iconography and it's really a very nice um, complement to what we're building across the street uh, with the aquarium. Um, likewise, um, Mr. Provence, I have to disagree with you again, but, but only on this tiny little matter of design, which is the corona, because I think that it's going from fussy to elegant. Um, in the in in a in the in a very positive direction in terms of the design of the the grill, um, and then the last piece. Um, uh, well, that was it. Never mind. That's enough. But it's it's moving in a great direction. Thank you. Thank you. All in favor of the EDR as amended, say aye. 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 Opposed, no. Next item on the agenda is agenda item number 5C, and it's the Triangle Park Reservation, uh, Reservation 149, and we have Ms. Hirsch. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and members of the Commission. The National Park Service has submitted final plans for the rehabilitation of Reservation 149. Reservation 149 is located just north of DuPont Circle in Northwest Washington. The Park Service has been working with the DuPont Circle Citizens Association, as well as the historic DuPont Circle Main Street organization on the project. The project is a result of $70,000 in mitigation funding from the um, planned unit development agreement of 1000 Connecticut Avenue, which is located at Connecticut and K Street. The project presents an opportunity to rehabilitate a original Lone Font Reservation. Um, the Lone Font plan with the diagonal avenues and the <coughs> orthogonal grid overlaid on top of that, as we all know, has created a system of um, parks and open spaces throughout the city. <coughs> reservation 149 is one of those and is bound by Connecticut Avenue on the east, Q Street to the south, and 20th Street to the west. Um, it's directly north of the DuPont Circle Metro Station, and there are two WMATA bus stops on the reservation, one to the south and one on the north end. The project consists of uh, essentially five elements, mostly repair and replacement of um, in-kind materials. The flagstone plaza will be repaired, as well as the quarter-round concrete curbs that edge the plaza. Um, and then the concrete flat work that is underneath the benches. All of the uh, trash receptacles will be replaced with the Park Service standard, as well as um, the turf and benches will be restored, and then one of the cherry trees that is in declining health will be replaced with a Chinese fringe tree. Uh, the two new elements of the project include um, a proposed 30-inch high fence on the south uh, corner, as well as a modification to the southeast corner in order to improve pedestrian circulation. The scope of the project was partially developed in response to the existing conditions on the site. You can see here the sidewalk along Connecticut is um, relatively restricted by um, its a, is fairly narrow width. Um, it's difficult for pedestrians to move back and forth as well as have the bus stop right here on the south end. Um, you can also see that um, the formation of a path um, through the reservation on where there was um, turf at one point, but has been um, the soils become very compacted from um, a number of pest pedestrians moving to and from the bus stop to the um, crosswalk in order to get to the metro station. Staff's analysis of the project focused on primarily four er areas, um, including the rehabilitation of a historic reservation, uh, the circulation issues um, along Connecticut and the sidewalk, and then NCPC's policies and plans, including the comprehensive plan, 
And then um, we also took into context the um, development of a community amenity with the development project. The Park Service, in response to the concerns regarding the circulation along Connecticut, um, has proposed to um, round the southeast corner of the reservation. Um, this will help improve pedestrian circulation at this corner. In addition, the Park Service has met with WMATA and the Ward 2 Councilman's Office um, to discuss moving the bus stop, and WMATA has agreed to move that bus stop that's right here on the south to across Q Street. Um, the bus will now stop in front of the DuPont Circle Metro Station rather than on the reservation. Um, so there should be fewer pedestrians uh, making this the, the travel path between uh, the reservation and the metro. In addition, the Park Service has proposed a 30-inch high fence on the south end of the reservation, uh, similar to the image you see in the upper left. Um, <clears throat> the fence would also keep pedestrians from cutting across the reservation to protect the turf and um, direct pedestrians to use um, the sidewalk. And with that, the executive director's recommendation is to re approve the final de site development plans for the rehabilitation of Reservation 149. Is there a discussion? Mr. Chairman, um, I just wanted to make a statement about this. We've had some um, further uh, discussions with uh, members of the community and internally about what's been proposed for this uh, reservation. And um, given the pushback that we've had about the fence element, which is actually one of the major reasons why it's, this even comes before the commission, but for the most part it's a very straightforward rehab of existing conditions. Um, we're, we're at this moment, we're proposing not to put in the fence. Um, and if we determine that we need to put in some sort of an element that would um, uh, address the issue of, the, of people cutting across the, the corner of the, of the uh, park and uh, trampling the grass, um, whether it's a fence or some other means of doing that, that uh, if need be, we would come back to the commission. Um, at that point, but for right now, we're not proposing to do the fence. Why can't you just go ahead and assume that people are going to be trampling the grass like they always have? Well, the movement of the bus stop is going to significantly reduce that, and uh, what we're trying to do is make sure that we're not compromising the safety of people walking on that sidewalk, because if, if there are too many obstacles in the way um, and they can't step into the park, we don't want people stepping into the street. Okay. Other discussion, Mr. Hart? Yeah, I had a question on why the Connecticut Avenue sidewalk is significantly narrower than the other two streets. Um, you know, all of the triangles in the city have evolved over the years. Um, and in fact, this, this uh, reservation used to be substantially larger. It was widened when the underpass was put in. Um, and I think that when they made that decision, they, they didn't anticipate the level of uh, pedestrian traffic, certainly didn't anticipate the metro um, going in uh, there and, the, and this connection between the bus stop and the metro occurring. So it is, I mean, it is, it is what it is, but it, it, it evolved to that. I'm not sure what the original sidewalk width was in the original Connecticut. Uh, I'm, I'm just wondering if it had anything to do with the, the volume of pedestrian movement where you would assume more pedestrians, wider sidewalk. Well, you know, again, I don't know what their thinking was at the time. I mean, certainly if we were designing this um, reservation right now from scratch, we'd be looking at where the highest volumes of, of uh, traffic are, and it, would, it may well be wider at that point. Is this not like a complete reconstruction? It is not like a complete okay. reconstruction. This is a re really a very modest project. Um, I just want to commend uh, Commissioner May and the decision to not uh, put a fence in. As you may or may not know, one of the most popular markets in the entire city, the DuPont Farmers Market, is just on the other side of, uh, of 20th Street, I'm sorry, of Q Street here. Um, and I think anything that would kind of impede the flow of mm -hmm. people who've, you know, gotten an apple or something to enjoy at the Farmers Market and who might want to hang out in this lovely little could be lovelier, but this little park, um, you know, that that fence would, would be a real barrier to that. And certainly your point about safety uh, mm -hmm. in the event, as there episodically are, you know, crowds of people that on the right. sidewalk, I think that's a, um, that's, a, that's a very sensible decision, and I commend you, and uh, thank you. Thanks. We do have one person signed up to speak 
on mm -hmm. this. Uh, Mr. David Alpert, representing Greater Greater Washington. Um, as your representing organization, you have five minutes. Welcome. Thank, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman and members of the Commission. Uh, my name is David Alpert. I run the website Greater Greater Washington, which discusses issues of urban planning and transportation in the D.C. metropolitan area. I also live about three blocks from this particular park and use the DuPont Circle Metro very frequently, as well as the park on, on numerous occasions. Um, I uh, want to thank the Park Service for uh, undertaking this project. Uh, money uh, that became available from, uh, through the neighborhood um, uh, was able to, uh, to pay for it, and, and it's great to see this park being rehabilitated because it is, in fact, in, in very poor repair. Um, I also want to thank uh, the Park Service for removing the fence from the plans. Um, I was very concerned about uh, the fence for a number of reasons, uh, going beyond, in fact, the width of the Connecticut Avenue sidewalk, though that is definitely one of those reasons. The other reason is the fact that uh, very many people use this park as an opportunity to sit uh, before or after they use the metro, meet people, and things of that nature. Uh, it's great to have this space with benches uh, for that purpose, uh, but many people cross directly from the metro to the area with benches. And if you looked at, at the, uh, it showed in the, in the diagram as well, another area of worn down uh, turf where people uh, cross directly. Uh, the design of the park as it is today essentially turns its back on the metro station. All of the benches are arrayed in a U shape away from the metro. This, I presume, is because the metro did not exist at the time the park was built. Uh, neither did actually the underpass on Connecticut Avenue, so circumstances were very different. Uh, now, uh, you know, perhaps if the park were being designed, it would face the metro or, or something of that nature. So to, to shut people off from that with a fence that requires them to walk around would, would be basically sending a signal that, that uh, this park is not interested in being an open space for people to traverse directly from the metro. Um, I think it, it was deleted from the, the description before the earlier one, but there was something in there in the, in the initial uh, document about remedying a social path. And, and I just want to sort of point out that language and, and say that I really hope we don't see that language in anything in, in the future because that basically means to me that we're saying you know, the purpose of this is to stop people from going in a place that they want to go to utilize a park. You know, the purpose of our park should be to accommodate, you know, the uses, that, you know, the enjoyment of, of the space, the open space, which, which is what it's for. Um, uh, the rounded corner, I think, um, does not necessarily add uh, very much additional space. You know, that diagram showed a lot more uh, space that people were using um, beyond just the small rounded corner, though moving the bus stop most likely will will suffice uh, or may suffice uh, to, to provide extra pedestrian circulation. Uh, I guess we'll see based on, on whether the grass gets worn down again now. Um, I, ideally, uh, this would have been an opportunity to actually change some elements of the design. And I was actually told by members of the community who had been dealing with this for several years that they were told by the, the Park Service that they weren't going to be allowed to consider any redesigns to the layout of the hardscape. Um, I think that's a, a shame just because, uh, again, you know, it's, it's been a long time and the circumstances around the park have changed and it would certainly have been possible to design a new park layout that's sort of uh, compatible with the initial intent and, and feel of the park, uh, but without maybe being quite so, so obviously adherent to the exact position of every individual bench and, and sidewalk element. Um, so at this point, that's, that's apparently not possible, but there are a number of other reservations that are being either repaired or potentially uh, modified. Uh, I know uh, like one in Chinatown is, is under consideration, the Chinatown Park, um, for example. And I hope that we can have the opportunity as more of these small reservations are fixed up to, you know, take a look at what's the best way to lay them out to, you know, still be true to the purpose of the park, but also accommodate the uses of the city today and the residents and the visitors who would use those parks. Thank you very much. I'd be happy to answer any questions if you might have any. Thank you, Mr. Alpert. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, if I can say a couple of words. Um, sure. You know, I think when it comes to fixing up parks like this uh, or other parks within the city, we are very interested in hearing what people have to say about the current design and use of the park. And certainly we learn things by patterns that develop uh, desire lines that develop across <coughs> our, the parks. And we try to do what we can to, uh, uh, to accommodate those. Um, we also are um, a bit constrained in the environment we're in, having to deal with historic preservation issues and having to deal with um, compliance with uh, NEPA. Not that those are necessarily reasons in themselves not to do something, they just make it a little bit longer and more complicated. Um, but I think we're certainly always interested in hearing what, um, what members of the public have to say, what particular user groups have to say when they make use of these parks. and. Uh, 
Uh, I'm, I'm frankly encouraged by the discussion that's occurred in the process of this project, and uh, I think that we'll wind up with a better park as a result, and I look forward to that continuing um, as we go forward. It might be too late, but one suggestion I might make that has nothing to do with any placement of the benches, but, um, but if they were backless benches, people could orient themselves however they wanted to on the space. They could face the metro. They could face away from the metro. If they're wide enough, you could both face the metro and have someone face away from the metro, which might you know, be an acknowledgment of this but without actually moving the placement of any of the street furniture. Just a right. thought. Um, uh, I actually would like to ask Steve Lorenzetti, who's the deputy superintendent, to step up. I think that he's indicating that there is some flexibility on the benches, but uh, he knows more of the details than I do. Yes, good afternoon. I'm Steve Lorenzetti, Deputy Superintendent at National Mall Memorial Parks, and that's something we could definitely look at. I don't think it's too late to look at that. Good suggestion. Mr. Benjamin. One additional comment about the fence. Appreciate the uh, receptivity from the Park Service to removing the fence. Uh, a 30 inch high fence in between a uh, pedestrian and a bus stop. We're glad to hear that the bus stop is going to be removed presents nothing but an opportunity to impress the young ladies and hurdle at your peril over that fence, not once but twice to get to the bus stop. So Speak from experience, do you? <laughs> it's, it's been a few years, sir. And those, those injuries have healed uh, over, over time. <laughs> Thank you for that. Thank you. Hearing no additional discussion, uh, I'm sorry, Mr. Miller, excuse me. Yeah, I just wanted also to thank the uh, Park Service for uh, remo removing the fence and being receptive to the uh, comments about the uh, the benches. And uh, I think, because I think that the comments that Mr. Alpert made are, are all very appropriate. And uh, uh, historic preservation doesn't have to lock us into a t whatever 150-year-old design that didn't account for common, uh, I mean, c current day circumstances. Um, and if you need assistance in paving uh, any of the uh, desire lines within your jurisdiction, just, just call upon DDOT. <laughs> uh, Mr. Costa. Um, if the commission is, uh, or if, if they are not planning to put in the fence, the commission should amend this uh, EDR oh, with, uh, with an exception. Uh, proposed fence? Yeah. I, I, actually, I would prefer that it be written, noting that the Park Service has removed the uh, fence from the from the uh, proposal. Because when people look back on this a few years from now, they'll note that we did it as opposed to the commission deciding it should not happen. Okay. Thanks. <laughs> okay, I don't think we have to have the exact words. We, we have the concept, so the okay. concept of that language, uh, is there a motion on that language? I would that, move the EDR with the language as no, noted. it's a friendly amendment, yeah. And it's been moved and seconded. Uh, sensing no further discussion, all in favor of the amended EDR say aye. 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 Opposed no. Thank you. That concludes our meeting uh, today.